With the advent of modern-day telescopes, radar, and satellites, it would be thought that transits are a thing of the past. But there are new uses and new interest in transits. Today, astronomers use transits to detect planets orbiting distant stars. NASA Ames Research Center at Moffett Field, California is home to NASA's Kepler mission. The Kepler mission is a NASA discovery program for detecting potentially life-supporting planets around other stars. The Kepler mission uses the transit method, and that's a method that's been used here on Earth for really uh, groundbreaking, important scientific discoveries, in particular that of Venus. For a long time, people understood the planets were spaced in a regular fashion, but they didn't know the distance. And so, at the time of Captain Cook and others, they sent missions to various countries to look at a transit of Venus to see what the distance was from the Earth to the Sun. And that measurement of the time it took Venus to go across the Sun allowed us to get that distance from the Earth to the Sun and make all the measurements that we know about with respect to the size of our solar system. When a planet moves in front of its star, that blocks some of the light of the star. So we're measuring the brightnesses of about 150,000 stars simultaneously. And if any one of them dims, we measure the, how much it dims, and that tells us how big the planet is compared to the star. And then we look for repetition. When that planet does it over again, that gives us the year of the planet. How long is that year? If the year is a few days or a few weeks, then it's too hot, too hot to be in the habitable zone of that star. If it takes uh, years for it to re repeat, then it's too far away from its star. Everything is frozen. The ocean is frozen. Allowing for Kepler's third law of planetary motions, transits can be used to estimate the distance from an exoplanet to its central star, which helps astronomers decide if the planet is inside the habitable zone of that star. So we're looking for orbital periods close to that of the Earth, a few months to about a year, so that we know that planet is at the right distance from its star to have water, possibly, on its surface, the right temperature range for life to develop. When I talk about a habitable zone, really what I'm talking about is a temperature range where water could exist on the surface of a solid planet. Because if you have liquid water, we imagine that it's quite possible that you might be able to develop life. Whereas, if the temperature is much hotter than the boiling point of water, we don't think life is likely to develop there. Similarly, if the planet's so far away from a star that all the water is frozen, the oceans are frozen, the lakes are frozen, again, we don't think life is likely to develop there either. So the habitable zone is sort of a temperature range that a planet would have if it's at the right distance from a star so that you could have water on its surface. As we are making progress in uh, searching for life, it's interesting that it takes us to places that we consider extreme, and extreme is obviously with respect to human living on that planet. So extreme and too hot here is too hot with respect to us because we would burn ourselves, right? But on Earth, you have organism living in very hot springs, for instance, a temperature where you would scald yourself. You have organisms that are living in very cold environment, too cold for us. You have organisms that are capable of sustaining level of radiation that would kill you almost instantly. But they exist and they multiply and as we see different environments here on Earth, it is very possible that uh, there is a different life elsewhere in the universe. And more importantly, we know that the ingredients that make life possible here on Earth are abundant in the universe. One recent discovery by the Kepler mission will be viewable by astronomy hobbyists around the time of the upcoming transit of Venus. One of the interesting things about uh, what we're discovering is we've actually found a planet that orbits two stars. It's called Kepler-16b, and it's going to actually transit uh, these stars at about the same time that people around the world are using their telescopes to look at Venus transiting the Sun. 
it's profound to realize that while people are looking at Venus crossing our sun, there is another faraway planet crossing a pair of suns at about the same time of the year. And in both cases, people can see this with their telescopes on June 28th. So, will we ever meet an alien? Maybe, maybe not. But if it turns out that we are alone in the universe, it isn't cause to weep because with the discoveries by the Kepler mission, it opens the possibility that the Milky Way and beyond is ours to colonize and explore. At that time, our new adventure will begin. The Kepler mission has learned so much, made so many discoveries, that we're going to be rewriting all the books on astronomy. We see planets from the size of Mars to planets twice the size of Jupiter, so a huge range of planets. We're finding planets in the habitable zone of stars cooler than the Sun. It's going to take us a while to find planets in the habitable zone of a star like the Sun, because that simply takes a longer period of time. The missions that we expect to follow on Kepler, for example, use the Kepler results to design the instrument that looks at the atmospheres of these planets to see if there's water vapor, is there CO2? But even then, even those missions are not likely to answer that question fully. We want to know, is there life? What kind of life is it? And that kind of mission will follow those missions. And they're probably missions that are built by our grandchildren, possibly sending television cameras to these stars to look. But right now, we're concentrating on this step, the step, are there other Earths?